and we should be live. Let's have a look. Hey guys, welcome. Uh, it's me, Lloyd De Jong. For those who have difficulty with my with my surname, it's De Jong, of course. My first name is Lloyd, spelled L L O Y D, not O Y O Y D. Sorry, not Y O D. Just just to get that clear. Hey guys, welcome. Good to see you all. There's lots of people in the chat. And I'm here with Austruth Apologetics. Say hello, AT. Hello. Um, can everybody hear us okay? Just make sure that both of us are coming through clear. Just type a one in real quick on the uh, chat there. So we don't want to have any technical difficulties for like three minutes before anybody says anything. So um, what up, Debit Rabbit? Um, I don't know. Veronica, hey, yeah, hello. Just... Hey, is right. <laughs> Lloyd is also Arab. No, Lloyd is South African. Yeah, see, there you go. He speaks. He speaks South African. I assume that's uh, whatever that is, whatever language that it is. It was Arabic. <laughs> um, not Arabic. That was Arabic. <laughs> uh, Assalamu alaikum. That's about. That's about the only uh, Arabic I I know. So. Yeah, Achleb Dani Belmay Sukhne. Achleb Dani Belmay. Achleb Dani Belmay Al Sukhne. Oh gosh, I used to know how to request things. I used to speak some Arabic when I was living yeah. in the Middle East. <laughs> so hey guys welcome thanks all for, for being here the south african language actually um african afrikaans if you look at the white tribe of africa the afrikaners afrikaner means african so this is the white tribe of africa afrikaans is means african so their language afrikaans means mm. african so so the white tribe of africa the afrikaners see themselves as african they were basically outcast from Europe. They were not accepted back by the Europeans. They were left on their own. So they had to develop their own identity. Interesting. And so they became African. Um, yeah, I will do a story on a show on apartheid just to annoy people one day because that's exactly what it's going to do. But in many, many ways, irrefutably, apartheid was very good for black people. And... Um, and I say this because I can bring the facts. I am tired of the, the narrative. I'm tired of the false narrative. Half my family is white. And I am not going to have people besmirch my family mm. just because they're white. And Afrikaners are good people. Mistakes were made. But I am not going to accept that 98% that, uh, of the time, Afrikaners, in many cases, were good people. Just like same story with the jews that first story that story was first tried on afrikaners it succeeded and uh, they're trying it now in israel and now they're trying it in america too so yeah okay guys uh at before we begin any comments you want to make well i mean I, i'm i'm excited to get started on this this gnostic idea i think a lot of us will be surprised how gnosticism is still alive and well today um how it has kind of infiltrated a lot of our are even Western thinking, uh, but more so what Lloyd's put together for us is going to be really interesting and in how that Gnostic thinking has definitely infiltrated um, in, into Islam and is probably more alive and well in Islam than it is in any other kind of um, religious ideology. So I'm excited to, yeah. to get going, brother. Okay, yeah. So I guess, guys, we'll just, get, we'll just jump in. Um, thanks for those who gave us support last week with the... Uh, when we spoke about Palestine or Fakistan. Um, yeah, I'm surprised that that didn't blow up in the comments section. Um, but yeah, I hope that was useful education for you. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so guys, if you have questions for me, please at Lloyd de Jong and or at Austruth so we can see the chat as it rolls. Mm -hmm. So let me dive in. I'm just going to go to the main screen. <clears throat> so I'm going to bring this up. Get this ready, move this over. So guys, we are going to be talking about Gnosticism. Gnosticism is the belief, well, amongst its beliefs, is that the world of matter is evil and that the spirit alone is good, that the spiritual realm alone is good. Um, there are parallels very much today within the woke ideology. You will see this. Uh, we can discuss this briefly, but my focus really is going to be on Islam, how Islam is a Gnostic religion. Let me bring up additional set of notes that we're going to need. So everything that I'm going to be discussing, all these notes, will be available in the um, description box. So please have a look there. I'm going to be using this edition of the Reliance of the Traveler. 
Again, everything in the description box. And let's begin. So, Gnosticism, and unfortunately this, this really upsets me when I think of academics, they call it Christian Gnosticism, mm -hmm. as if these were forms of Christianity. They will call it, there were multiple Christianities early on. No, there was one Christianity and there were anti-Christian faiths yep. who were dead set against it. Gnosticism is the inversion of Christianity. It demotes Jesus. Mm -hmm. well, very simply, it denies, in many cases, his divinity, or it, in some way it messes with that. But we're going to talk about how Islamic Gnosticism demotes Jesus, deifies or makes him a god, it makes Je not Jesus, sorry, Muhammad a god. And let's continue. So, Arianism to Islam. Now, the earliest Gnostic faith that is well known to the church was Arianism because Arianism threatened to tear the church apart in the early days, mm -hmm. right? Arianism is the reason that we had the Nicene Creed and the Council of Nicaea. No matter what others might tell you, the reason for the Nicene Creed and for the Council of Nicaea was specifically due to a heresy, a Gnostic heresy called Arianism. Now, Gnosticism is the greatest threat to ever face the church then and now. Mm -hmm. So we're going to talk today about what Gnostics believed. We're going to talk about the overlaps with Islam and Allah. We're going to provide evidence of Gnosticism as integral and normative to Islam. Right? We're going to speak of the Nicene Creed as a refutation of numerous heresies. We're going to discuss a few Gnostic heresies. Let me just move my camera to the top right. We're going to speak of some biblical warnings and further evidence of Islamic Gnosticism. Mm -hmm. Then we're going to discuss how Gnosticism demotes Jesus, how Islam then promotes Muhammad to a deity, as most specifically as the light of the world. This is the true replacement theology. This is Islamic replacement theology, where it replaces everything, mm -hmm. right? And then we'll speak of Islamic orthodoxy and the negative teachings about Christianity and also about Judaism, but we'll, we'll focus largely on Christianity in this episode. So, right, let's continue. Gnosticism is the first major threat to the church. Gnosticism was the greatest challenge and greatest threat to the early church, but Gnostic ideas are thriving today. So in its early history, the church was opposed by several mystery religions. Now, this is an overview. I'm going to be bringing multiple topics and like, we can explore each topic in detail later. But there were these mystery religions. The mystery was that they had secrets. You see, they, they knew the secret of the universe. They knew that secret knowledge that you don't have, secret knowledge that led to salvation. So these mysteries involved secret societies, and Islam is built on secret societies. The largest secret society in the world is the Muslim Brotherhood. The Muslim Brotherhood has two to three million members and about a hundred million adherents. If you look at that mathematically, there are about eight million Jews in the world, and there's about a hundred million people that follow the Muslim Brotherhood. So that's a lot of people. Occult magical rituals and practices. Now, Islam certainly is guilty of this too. I'm not going to go into huge amounts of detail, but this is also something that is part and parcel of Islam. Mm -hmm. Gnosticism involves levels of understanding. Islam most explicitly has levels of understanding where you have to be initiated into different levels. You have to gain secret knowledge and then move up to various levels. There's also the denial of Jesus' divinity, his death, resurrection, and humanity. Various aspects of these are part of Gnosticism, as well as Islam. And then, of course, you have radical reinterpre reinterpretation of biblical doctrine. This, of course, is part and parcel of Islam. Uh, mm -hmm. Comments, A.T.? Yeah, um, so uh, I, I think we went into this last time we spoke live, just talking about the occult and magical rituals, and, and um, what was the name of the the god or the, the Satan figure that had the crescent? Um, with the star oh, Baphomet. On. Yeah. Um, so those are, those are some very interesting things that kind of go into I'll bring it. That up. Uh, especially talking about the secret societies and, and things like that. Um, it's very interesting when you start to look into the history of where secret societies, yep, exactly him, where, where secret societies began, um, and how they are actually influenced, uh, if not started by, um, by Muslim types of, of groups. Uh, Lloyd, I, I would like to hear you explain to me more again, kind of the different levels of 
Islam. I mean, because from what I understand, there is the the basic lay Muslim, pretty much people you and I talk to um, on, on a daily basis. Um, then you have your mm -hmm. scholars, your imams. Yeah, I will get into that. Yeah. But that is that is part of this presentation. Okay, so I will perfect. get into that. Perfect. Yeah, bring it up if I if I don't if I don't get around to it soon enough. Definitely. The Black Hebrew is the fake Hebrew Israelites <laughs> has incorporated the majority of the interpretation of scripture from Islam. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Arianism, many other Judaizing, yeah, yes, Judaizing heresies, yes. Hey, Daniel, good to see you after a long time. Right, let's see. Okay, now, very briefly, Gnosticism. Gnosticism is the belief that salvation comes through secret knowledge, also known as sacred knowledge, also known as sacred science. Mm -hmm. Right? Gnosticism is the idea that the physical world is corrupt, even evil, unlike the ideal spiritual realm. And that the material realm is created and ruled by a lesser God, potentially even an evil God in some interpretations. Yep. So Gnosticism is a religious dualist system of belief arising in the second century. Now, understand that before you had Christian Gnosticism, you had Jewish Gnosticism, mm -hmm. right? So Gnosticism goes way back, long before Christianity. So, but now you have Christian Gnosticism. So this goes back to the second century and it held that matter is evil, that spirit is good, and it claimed that salvation was attained only through esoteric knowledge or the gnosis, the gnosis, the Greek gnosis. Yep. Right. Now let's have a look. Let's, let's look at the philosophy of Gnosticism. It comes in many varieties and interpretations from ascetic to licentious. Now licentious is an interesting word. This, this might remind you of a certain prophet. <laughs> The Who definition of licentious, <laughs> lacking legal or moral restraints, especially disregarding sexual restraints, mm -hmm. marked by disregard for strict rules of correctness. Does this remind you of anybody, A.T.? Well, it, it reminds me of Muhammad, but when you said um, licentious, I, I thought you were talking about the time that Muhammad had lice. I, I thought that's what you meant was reminding <laughs> you of, oh, no, of Muhammad. That, but now I understand yeah, it's that, that's also worth raising. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, by Irenaeus. Okay, fantastic. Uh, Falcon Gage says, yeah. And um, Okay, so, yeah, I'm going to try and provide an overview of this that's probably not common knowledge as yet. Also, you, we're not going to go into this at length, but look up the word antinomianism. This is worth knowing about, something I should talk about in the future. So, it is a religious philosophy and a worldview. It's a framework to explain the nature of God and creation, right? So, its own, it's, it is its own creation narrative, mm -hmm. right? It also tries to explain good and evil, and in brackets you see the problem of evil. It tries to explain the problem of evil. Yeah. It also speaks about man and the purpose of life, and Gnostics do tend to focus on the inner life of the spirit, mm -hmm. which they differentiate from the material life. Think of the term, I identify as, <laughs> you see. I've never heard that before. What do you mean, identify as? Wokeness is Gnostic, Yeah. right? Because within Christian belief, God made you, your spirit, and your body. You are your soul, your body. You are one, mm -hmm. right? So God made you. And Gnosticism believes that the spirit is a completely separate thing from your evil matter, right? From the corrupt, low matter. And therefore, what your spirit believes, that's the only true self. And therefore, I believe that I am what it, wokeness is Gnosticism, right? They come from the same belief as dualist belief. Mm -hmm. Right, now, Gnosticism and Gnosis in Islamic law, so I'm going to move us down to the... Now, we're going to examine numerous references to Gnosticism, Gnosis, and Gnostic Islamic scholars in the most famous and the most popular Islamic legal manual called The Reliance of the Travelers. So see the video description box for a download link. It is Reliance of the Traveler called the Umdat al Salik. I'm going to bring that up now. Okay, so I'm going to go here into my PDF reader. I'm going to type in the word G-N-O-S. Notice for Gnosis, there's 18 references. For Gnostic, there are five. For Gnostics, there are three. And Gnostics, one. Hmm. Right? With an apostrophe. So let's go. Now, for pure religion, it's interesting. And for one that has no antecedent, it's interesting that, that, is, that the most popular common Sunni Islamic manual in the world, right? Islamic law manual in the world, has this many references to Gnosis. Now, let's have a look here. This famous sheikh says... Okay, writes in his letter about the spiritual station of annihilation in Gnostic vision. Gnostic vision. So we have the stations of the cross. They have the stations of the Gnosis. Okay. Mm. Let's continue. 
it is a fault to stop at the first traces of gnosis you see you need to continue you can't you have to continue and push through right because others have claimed to have attained to gnosis and contemplative knowledge of the divine to have passed through spiritual stations and states and to have reached nearness to Allah. Mm. It goes on to say that, but but they're faking it. They're amateurs. We Muslims, we <laughs> Islamic scholars, we've done it. We, you know, we're the bee's knees here. So right, others we got to open claimed, up that third eye, man. That's what we got to do. I <laughs> understand. So let's continue. We have attained to Gnosis. They have attained to Gnosis. Right. Mm. The Gnostic in his first states is strongly affected by the initial impact and will blah, 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 blah. Let's have a look. The Gnostic's spiritual will, exalted above all else, must carry him beyond what we have just mentioned. He is outside of our frame of reference and all it contains. And then he you know, takes into the afterlife and, and secrets of the universe. Someone who has reached the level of those to whom the unseen is disclosed and have Gnostic insight. Let's continue. We've opened the door of gnosis, the door of knowledge, when they sniff the first traces of this knowledge, right? Gnosis, the knowledge, while immersed in the sea of Gnostic inspiration, right? Then they go on, the Sufi Gnostic, right? This guy. Then you have faith is comprehended through gnosis, the Islamic faith comprehended through gnosis, the grove of the Gnostics, the chess of the Gnostics, then reaching, reaching the throne room of Allah, reaching to perfection, reaching to salvation, See, Gnosis, interesting, Gnosis, subsistence. Gnosis, Gnosis, Sufism, Sufism is Gnosticism, period. Yeah. Gnosis, 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 I, Sufi Gnosis, no, you, you get the point. Understand? Gnosticism, and this is, not the, it's, it's, this is not the only manual that has explicit references to Islam and the scholars of Islam being Gnostics and Islam being Gnostic. Mm -hmm. AT, your thoughts? Well, and, and I think what's interesting about this is, first of all, so the idea of Gnosticism, I think, originates with the earliest Greek philosophers um, who, who identified kind of the material world as as being dirty and unclean and something unsavory, something that mm -hmm. the internal spirit of a person um, should be transcending. Um, now, this this idea came during what's known as the axial age. It's It's the age of kind of awareness and thought that um, people across the world um, became quote-unquote enlightened to. So you'll see other major world um, religions such as Buddhism starting around that same time talking about, you know, leaving behind all, all of your attachments. Um, other religions um, such as Taoism came up around that same time and same with Confucianism, if mm -hmm. I said that correctly. Um, all of those thinkings, those are those are very philosophical um groundwork right which ended up be laying the groundwork for paganism just in general uh and lloyd you and i did a video series talking about these mystery religions um and how they painted jesus as this mysterious figure and how they think christianity is based in some sort of mystery religion but uh, mm -hmm. now that we're going through this you can actually see that christianity is um diametrically opposed to yeah. these greek and gnostic ideas um and we're, so we're going to bring this up yeah. That. yeah so a couple of questions someone asked is nag hamadi close to mecca if someone can find out what the distance is check on google earth or something or google maps find out what the distance is that'll be interesting yeah nag hamadi obviously is the major find of gnostic texts because prior to that most of the gnostic beliefs were the ideas were found in the writings of early church fathers and others who wrote about them but a cache of major Gnostic texts was found in Nag Hammadi, Egypt. And thus, these Gnostic ideas made their way back into the Western world. And the whole heresy revived itself and became debit right. I'll get into the monad. We'll get into all of that. Someone asked me, is Islam the real, is Sufism the real Islam? Yes. Sufism is the complete expression of Islam. It is not just the following the law of Allah, obeying his will. It is also following and, or rather knowing the character of Allah, contemplating the nature of Allah. I'll get into that. So Gnosticism is the cult of special knowledge. It comes from the Greek word, the Gnosis, or knowledge. Now, let's consider the strong overlap here with Allah. We're going to be talking about this. Gnosticism has a belief in a remote, supreme, absolute one deity called the Monad. This is the Gnostic supreme deity, the supreme God, right? So Allah 
happens to be a remote supreme absolute one deity. Am I correct, AT? Uh, yes, yes. Completely incapable of entering into um, his own creation, even though he enters into his own creation uh, on multiple occasions. Well, they'll explain that away for us. But so there's no differentiation in the monad and there is no differentiation in Allah. Right? The monad is beyond human thought, and human thought cannot reach it. It is beyond comprehension. This is precisely what Islamic scholars claim about Allah. There is no difference here. Right? Let's continue. So, similarities with Allah, page 2. The divine monad is beyond the material and the rational world. Now, ask yourself, why doesn't Allah enter into the physical realm? Why doesn't Allah come to earth? Because Allah does not enter into the filth of creation. Right? And I'm going to get into the story, but briefly speaking, the monad creates, right? The monad, the monad creates other beings, lesser beings, and one of these lesser beings, an evil lesser being, created the world. The world is made of matter. It's the lowest form of reality, and thus mm -hmm. evil and dirty. And the monad is too pure, too pure to come into this realm. Allah does not enter the dirty physical realm. Thus, the Christian incarnation is unacceptable in Islam. Think of the polemic emphasis on Jesus as a baby being unclean within Islam. This is a very strong polemic. See Ibn Qayyim. Polemic is an argument against the religion, right? Mm -hmm. See Ibn Qayyim, guidance to the uncertain in reply to the Jews and the Nazarenes. Let's have a look and see what, what major scholar, top scholar of Islam, Ibn Qayyim has to say. A religion whose structure is founded on the worship of crosses and pictures on the ceilings and walls, proclaiming that the Lord descended from the chair of his glory and became attached to the inside of a woman's womb. And he dwelled in there for a period of time amidst the location where the sexual organs join. Then he came out as a suckling, growing up, gradually crying, eating, drinking, urinating, sleeping and playing with other children. Right? He, that. Wait a second. Playing with children is a disgusting thing? Yes. yes. I, thought, I thought the best of mankind played with a, a little child's dolls. Yeah, well... Islam wasn't meant to make sense, okay? okay. The, right, these good. are the roots of those whose religion is entrenched in the belief that the Lord of the heavens and the earth descended from the authority of his greatness and his throne. Allah's throne is called the Arsh. I suppose you could pronounce it the Arsh. Allah sits on his Arsh. Anyway, <laughs> descended from the authority of his greatness and throne and entered the vagina of a woman who eats, drinks, urinates, evacuates her bowels and menstruates. Then he got attached to the inside of her abdomen and dwelled there for nine months, wobbling. This is Jesus they're talking about, right? Wobbling between excrement, urine, and menstrual blood. Then he was born to be swaddled, put in the cradle, and each time he cried, his mother breastfed him. Then he ended up being slapped on the cheeks by Jews. The Lord of the wars and the creator of the heavens and earth descended from his throne and the chair of his magnificence entered the womb of a woman in the place of the monthly period and menstrual discharges for several months. He came out of the vagina, a born child suckling her breast and crying. And we'll get into how Muhammad came out of the vagina. Muhammad came out of the vagina with a bright light that shone out of his mom's vagina for 1,300 kilometers lighting up the castles in Busra and Syria. But we're going to get to that. Okay. <laughs> So, he grew up eating, drinking, uh -huh. urinating, recovering from illness and sickness. Then he made a plot against his archenemy, Satan, by giving himself away to his enemies, the Jews, who arrested him and drove him to two slabs of wood to crucify him. These are 800-year-old arguments mm -hmm. that are very much in use today. This is, the, this is very much what Muslims teach about Christianity and about Jesus. Just a short introduction to this. Okay? So... The divine, so the monad continuously emanates lower divine beings called eons. Now the question was here, Debit Rai, if Allah does not enter dirty physical realm, then what's the point of Gnosticism when they believe in the monad, if the monad doesn't even care for his creation? Well, you see, your soul wants to go back there. That spark of the divine within you, that spark of Muhammad. Sorry, why did I say the divine? That spark of Muhammad, <laughs> the light of Muhammad that is within you, that, that is your soul, that wants to go back to, to paradise. You see, mm -hmm. and, and the earth is a trap and you need to be freed from the earth, the trap, the prison planet that is earth. But we'll, we're getting to all of that. So the monad continuously emanates, it not gives birth, but it emanates lower divine beings called eons. Now, Islam also has this concept of continuous creation. Right. Biblically, God creates Adam and Eve and then they procreate. Right. This is something mm -hmm. obviously beneath the God of Islam, beneath the monad. 
In Islam, every child is a new creation, thus there is no concept of original sin. Original sin cannot be translate, transmitted. Right? So understand, this is how Islam sees it. Now, notice that that's why they give us a hard time theologically about the concept of original sin. Do you want to say anything, mm -hmm. A.T.? Just let me know if you want to. Just raise your hand if you want uh, to say anything. I will raise my hand. Keep going, brother. Now, the Nicene Creed specifically states that Jesus was born or made incarnate, depending on which version you read, as a refutation of Gnostic heresies. He became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. So it explicitly states that the divine took physical form right it explicitly states that the divine took this was shocking at the time this yep. was a major major statement to make in the fourth century third century it was an incredibly mm -hmm. powerful statement because the divine could not come to the low corrupt earth understand but the fact that the church took the stand in the face of everything against it this was a very powerful stand by the church so the monad emanations have an element Remember the word emanations. We're going to come back to that. You're going to see it all over Islamic texts. Have an element of the divine essence. So angels and other powers are in the spectrum of these emanations. So they too are worshipped. Right? And of course, Jesus is on this spectrum too. So he's worshipped, but he's not a supreme being. Right? So now, let's look at Colossians 2 verse 8. Paul writes, See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition, and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. You see, there was also the element of, of angel worship. There was this phenomenon of angel worship back in the day. And of course the church mm -hmm. in the Colossians was taking on Gnostic ideas. Paul yep. wrote this letter to them to say, I'm sorry, but there no, you do not worship, you do not pay regard to other elemental forces, and you do not accept the idea for the Gnostics teach that Jesus wasn't real. He came mm -hmm. in bodily form go on yep well i was just saying so that's what um that's what the the gnostics believe right the gnostics believes that because christ was so pure that he did not actually take human form he was not flesh and blood he was some sort of uh aberration or or um uh the theocracy or the sorry i'm losing words here but um so they they thought that he just came basically in the spirit, but not in the, the flesh. flesh. So this is kind of where um, Gnostic ideas and Islam invert, right? So the 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 Gnostics took on this idea that Christ was some sort of divine being, or or some versions say that he was yeah. actually God himself. So they did not deny yeah. the pre incarnate Christ, whereas the um, the Islamic version of them, they invert that, right? So yep. they don't give him any kind of pre, pre yeah, we'll get incarnation. Into, yeah, we'll discuss that in more yep. depth as we go. So now let's look briefly at the Council of Nicaea, right? It says in brief below the image where we are. So the Council of Nicaea. Now, the first Council of Nicaea, the first council, was in 325 AD. Now, the first it was the first ecumenical council of the Christian church meeting in Nicaea. It's now called Iznik in Turkey. And I think Constantinople should be given back because Constantinople, as you know, is a Christian city. It was invaded by Muslims and they need to give it back. Okay. Which is what you do, apparently, when people invade. So it was called by the Emperor Constantine I. And he hoped a general council of the church would solve the severe problems created by Arianism a heresy first proposed by Arius of Alexandria. He was a presbyter. Presbyter is somewhere between a bishop and a high priest, right? A major priest. The, the Alexandria, though, as a source of Gnostic heresies, as a source of heresy, comes up incredibly often. Alexandria comes up all the time. Arius claimed that Christ is not divine, but a created being. Which other religion says that? Let me think for a minute. Islam. Mm-hmm. Okay, they explicitly state that he was a created being and Christ is not divine. Now, Arianism was condemned as a heresy. Now, let's look at the Nicene Creed, because the Nicene Creed was created at the Council of Nicaea. So the Nicene Creed is a refutation of heresies, and the Council of Nicaea was a refutation of the Arian heresy. Okay, so Emil Blonzi says, uh, Original sin cannot be transmitted in Islam, but Islam also says if Eve would not have sinned, the women, the women would not have betrayed Islam. Yeah, well, Islam is a mess. Okay. Yeah, so Mikhail van der Flis, the amount of apocryphal and Gnostic writings Muhammad copied, most certainly, even Talmudic mm -hmm. writings. Right. Yeah. Let's continue. 
So the Nicene Creed, I'm only going to look at two pages of it, okay, otherwise it would be a whole day. We believe in one God. This statement is against the Gnostics, who introduced, unfortunately, polytheism. The Father, the Almighty, against Gnostics. Maker of heaven and earth against the Gnostics. Why? Because they claim he had one God of the spirit realm and an evil God of the physical realm. But we believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth. That was explicitly put there as a refutation of major heresies to say God is the creator of this world and is divine and of the spiritual mm -hmm. realm. Of yep. all that is seen and unseen. So the first physical realm is seen and the unseen is the spiritual realm. And they said, no, no, he's the God of both. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only son of God as a refutation of heresy. Does Islam believe that Jesus is the son of God? No. Nope. Eternally begotten of the father. This is a refutation of the Arians and a, and a heresy called adoptionism. Mm -hmm. God from God, light from light, true God from true God. This was refutation of Arianism specifically and explicitly. Right. Yep. Begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Again, these are statements against Arianism. Now, this alone, this alone is an entire episode or two. Right. Through him, all things were made. This was a refutation, again, of Gnostics and Arians. For us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he was born. Those words, he was born, were very carefully placed there as a refutation of multiple heresies. Right of the Virgin Mary, and he became man as a real human being, physical, not a ghost, not a phantasm, not an illusion, right? Mm -hmm. Also, specifically, this is a refutation of Docetism and Ebionism. Now, for our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered, died, and was buried against Docetism. On the third day, he rose again in fulfillment of the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. This is against modalism. Modalism, in very brief, is that there's only one God, but he changes states. Like now he's Jesus, and then when he needs to do something else, he's the Spirit, and then he becomes the Father. <laughs> okay. Even though they're all present like during the baptism, and they talk to each other and stuff. It's just, Correct. Okay. It's Basically, my hand, my so the concept hand, right? of, you know, you've got to think of, of, the, of, of God as like, you know, now it's, it's water. You see, now it's steam, and then sometimes it's ice, and then sometimes it's water. That's modalism. Okay. Yep. Right. Who was the church father who wrote against heresies? Irenaeus, Michael. We're going to get into that briefly. I'm skipping pages. Now, Arianism. Let's, let's look at some of these Gnostic heresies. Arianism. Arianism is the precursor to the group that we now call the Jehovah's Witnesses. Mm -hmm. Okay. Arianism is a form of Unitarianism. It is thus anti-Trinitarian. Right. And sadly... It remained popular even after it was denounced as a heresy by the Council of Nicaea in 325. Mm -hmm. Now, Arius' basic premise was the uniqueness of God, who is alone, self-existent. He is not dependent for his existence on anything else and is unchangeable. Is Allah mm -hmm. like that, 280? Is that a description um, of Allah? Yes, yes, Allah he is doesn't at, need anybody? at this point, yeah. But I, I'll tell you what a lot of people don't realize is that if God is love, then there has to be an object of or in a subject to that love. And if God exists eternally, right, before creation and was alone in a singular person, um, who is there to love what subject and object is there of his divine love? Therefore, the modalistic or unitarian or um you know whatever the muslims believe their version of god actually ends up being um lacking in the sense of of having objects to love because before creation allah could not have love he could have nothing to love and there could be no glorification right so you need to have other people providing you glorification and you providing glory too so that's why the trinity the concept of the trinity yeah. solves all of these eternal problems. Yeah, David Rye makes a very good point. Unitarianism. <laughs> Unitarianism. That's a there fair point. <laughs> Arius. Unit I like that. So Unitarianism yeah. is is a heresy, right? Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you, Super Tiki. Much appreciated. And thank you all for being nice. here today, guys. Um, please do smash up the like buttons. Make jihad. Beat that like button till it's blue, okay? Mm -hmm. And uh, guys, AT's link is in the chat, is in the description box. Please sign up to his channel as well. Now, so 
Arius held the Christological position that Jesus, as Son of God, was a lesser being created by God and that the Son has no direct knowledge of the Father. Right? And then Arius' teaching effectively reduced the Son to a demigod, and thus it reintroduced polytheism, since worship of the Son was not abandoned. But now you had two gods. Mm -hmm. Understand? Now, which other religion says that we have multiple gods? Just, just so, by the way, Islam. We will get into that. Okay? Yeah, the Church of Nicaea is now a mosque. Now, that is very sad, I know. Now, of course, Arianism undermined the Christian concept of redemption, since only one who is truly God could be deemed to reconcile humanity to the Godhead. So, in other words, this removed the ability for Christ to redeem you. Right? Yep. So, this was obviously a major problem doctrinally. So, a brief summary of Docetism. Docetism comes from the Greek dokain, to seem. It's one of the earliest anti-Christian doctrines, and of course Docetism became an important doctrinal position of Gnosticism. It claimed that Christ did not have a real body. Right, That's why it was important to state that he was born of a virgin and became man. Mm -hmm. Now, reminder again, Gnosticism is the religious system of belief arising in the 2nd century, which holds that matter is evil, spirit is good, and claimed that salvation was attained through esoteric knowledge, or the Gnosis, the Gnosis. This heresy developed from speculations about the imperfection of matter, so or the impurity of matter. Some Docetists asserted that Christ was born without any participation of matter, and that all the acts and the sufferings of his life, including the crucifixion, were appearances or illusions. Mm -hmm. okay. I wonder where we got. I wonder where Islam got that idea from. Yeah, I, I have no idea. I, I can't, for the life of me, see any similarities here. Good grief! Right, and this and, I, and this idea essentially rose in the in the second century, right? Is is, is what you were second, saying? Second, third, you see. Yeah. So don't forget. Yeah. That, now the Docetists also denied Christ's resurrection, and they denied his ascension. But of course, Islam denies the resurrection, mm -hmm. right? Because obviously there was. Now let's have a look at the word esoteric. Esoteric means designed for or understood by the specially initiated alone. Right, a body of esoteric legal doctrine. Does that sound like the Sharia, which is understood only by a small group of scholars? Just so yeah. by the way. B mm -hmm. requiring or exhibiting knowledge that is restricted to a small group of scholars. It is limited to a small circle. It is special. It is rare. That is what esoteric means. Keep the, keep that in mind. Yeah. Now biblically, early forms are alluded to. Early forms of Docetism are alluded to in the New Testament, such as in the letters of John. You have 1 John 4, 1 to 3, and 2 John 1 to 7. This is not every single verse. I'm just going to show that these are some of the references, and you feel free to look deeper into all of these topics. Mm -hmm. 1 John 4, 1. Believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Know ye the Spirit of God, Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. Mm -hmm. They are very explicit to state come in the flesh. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. This is that spirit of Antichrist. Right. And it did, and just to take it one step further, I believe it's First John chapter 2, verse 22. It, it repeats that, come in the flesh, but it also says that you cannot have the Father without the Son, so you're also adding divinity to to Christ, right? Because the uh, Islam, the Muslims, they will add him as coming in the flesh, but they will deny that he is the Son of God. So I just wanted right. to add that one in there too. So Islam is a is a it's a mixture of all of these Gnostic ideas, and also it goes against them when convenient, it contradicts them as mm -hmm. well. I need to do a longer show on that another time, but. For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. That's 2 John 1, 7. So this is a deceiver and an antichrist. Right, let's look at Ebionism, right? It comes from the Hebrew Ebionim, the poor, right? So the Hebrew Ebionim, sometimes E-B-Y as well. They believed in one God, very familiar concept to Islam taught that mm -hmm. Jesus was the Messiah, and Islam does say that Jesus was the Messiah, but of course, Muhammad becomes the King Messiah. See, Muhammad mm -hmm. gets promoted in other scriptures to the King Messiah, because Jesus is the Messiah, so Mo is the King Messiah. He is the Shiloh, who is 
who is who is foretold in the prophecy in Genesis 49.1. Right? So now the Ebionists believed that Jesus was the Messiah, the true prophet, quote unquote prophet mentioned in Deuteronomy 18.15. The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren, like unto me, and unto him ye shall hearken. Other translations, he me shall worship, etc. But mm -hmm. which religion calls Jesus a prophet, so by the way, A.T.? Well, I mean, Christianity calls him a, a prophet, so I want to get that out of the way. He's a prophet, he's God, he's the Messiah, he's the, the Son of God, all of these but things. Islam really um, but Islam really believes he's a prophet. But Islam exclusively <laughs> keeps him as the Messiah and as a prophet, and nothing nothing more yep so exactly so they got this idea they took this idea from the ebionists that jesus was just a prophet so this again is an idea they adopted from gnostic mm -hmm. beliefs right let's continue the first mention of this particular heresy is in saint irenaeus right notably in his book adverses heresies or against mm -hmm. heresies circa 180 a.d okay yep. Right. Thank you, Dragon. Much appreciate. And uh, yeah, if you have any questions, just put my name there, at my name, and um, I'll try and answer those. Now, the Ibanists rejected the virgin birth of Jesus. Right. They claimed that he was the natural son of Joseph and Mary. The Ibanists mm -hmm. also believed that Jesus became the Messiah because he obeyed the Jewish law. Notice that Islam constantly says Jesus came to fulfill the law. Jesus followed the law. They harp right. on this point exactly like the Ibanists did. However... Ebionists followed the law, except when they didn't. So they followed the law, but removed what they regarded as interpolations. And mm -hmm. Islam says the Bible is filled with interpolations, by the way. In order to yep. uphold their teachings, which included vegetarianism, holy poverty, right? Ebionim, the poor. Ritual yep. ablutions. I wonder where Mo got that idea. And the mm, rejection of animal sacrifices. Mo took on that idea. And they held yep. Jerusalem in great veneration. I wonder where Mo got that idea. Yeah, right? You know, but one thing also too. So, so you can you can see a lot of similarities between Ebionism and Islam, right? They have a similar belief, and and this would work to perhaps strengthen the the Muslim claim that the Ebionites. I've heard this many times, especially by uh, Shabir Ali, um, are the predecessors of Islam. They were the true quote unquote Christians. Um, but then when you read the uh, Quran, it talks about how. Uh, Jesus was born of a virgin, right? So it, it just seems like Islam just picks things here and there, right? Because Ebionism mm -hmm. says that he was born, um, you know, regular, but, you know, by by regular union between man and woman. Mm -hmm. um, but they don't like that part, right? So they they like the story of him being born of a virgin, but they don't like the part of him being, you know, God, the Son of God. The, they don't like the story of Jesus dying on the cross because they lack any ability to think deeper than two inches. So. Yeah, that's my thing. Uh, Hayes White says, I like AT's apologetic contribution to the presentation. The speakers complement each other very well. Very deep and educational. Thank you both. You're welcome. Everyone says we're a great team except for me. And, and I fully agree with that. <laughs> I don't think we're a good team either. This is the most miserable, miserable part of my world. <laughs> Actually, no, most of um, the Muslims say we're... <laughs> if, if, if I may add one, one other comment here. Uh, yeah. Uh, Debit said something along the lines of, you know, there's so many heresies. Yeah. Um, and, and I think this strengthens the the fact that Christianity is the one true religion. And the reason why I say that is because if it were something totally obscure that was not able to bring about salvation, Satan would not try to replicate it in so many different ways, right? So there's yeah. a saying that I, I use a lot, and I heard it from Pastor Mark Driscoll the first time. Uh, it says whatever whatever God creates, Satan counterfeits, right? So God God creates yeah. Christianity, and then immediately you get all of these different counterfeit types of religions yeah, that you know obviously end up culminating in the movement of Islam. Yeah, yeah. Muhammad is counterfeit Jesus, quite bluntly. So let's continue. Mm -hmm. Let's look at Plotinus. Let's look at I've mentioned him before. Plotinus the One. Plotinus was a Roman, sorry, Greek philosopher. And he had a concept of the supreme deity, which he called the One. Now, briefly, Plotinus was a pagan Hellenistic philosopher from Alexandria. You'll notice Alexandria crops up all the time when you start reading this stuff. He despised Christianity, and he's the founder of Neoplatonism, or Neoplatonism. Right, let's continue. 
His writings were widely read within the time of Augustine of Hippo, which is about the 5th century, over 200 years before Muhammad's first revelation. Augustine counted many of the thoughts of Plotinus and his ideas in his book, The City of God, called On the City of God Against the Pagans, De Civitate De Contra Paganos. Now, let's look at a very high-level comparison of the one, Yahweh, the Christian God, and Allah. Right. So we'll look at aspects of this. Now, I will note that I don't necessarily agree with the original author with his um, representation of Allah fully. Okay, <clears throat> but that's it. It's pretty decent. And let's have a look. God is a creator, the one, a creator, Allah, the creator. So that's the sovereignty of the creator, the mm -hmm. nature of God. Okay, simple being with a complex nature. That's God. Okay, single being, rather, single being with a complex nature. The one by Plotinus, it was a simple unity. Now, what's interesting is unity, ehad, mm -hmm. ahad. Remember, ah Allah is, if you look at the Arabic, ahad, he is one of, one of many. Yep. Very odd yep. that they utilize that in that verse, right? Simple unity mm -hmm. beyond being. Now, why, if you were just one, why would you be a unity? Unity implies the joining of many. Allah, simple unity, pure will, okay, beyond being. Both of these describe Allah. But this, especially on this side, describes what we call the Sharia understanding of Allah. Allah as will, which is Allah as a lawgiver, right? The Sufis understand Allah in a different light. They understand the personality, the character of Allah, right? Actions, Allah is, God is intrinsic. And the one is extrinsic, outside of you. And Allah is outside of you, far away. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can he be known through reason and faith? Yes, Christians can understand God through reason and faith because they say that God is reason, God is logos. And that through mm -hmm. reason, we can understand the world, we can understand God's creation. Yep. The Ask, one seek, and knock. is knowable only through complete submission. Which religion requires submission, A.T.? I can't remember why my memory is going. <laughs> well, I would I would go so far as to say that probably all religions require submission to a certain certain level. But what does it mean? What religion says they're the religion of submission? Obviously, it's, it's Islam. Islam. Okay, yep. and Allah is inscrutable. So basically, Allah meets both of these criteria. Man's nature is free. In the one, you're a slave. And in, yep. in Islam, you're a slave. Basis mm -hmm. for obedience in Christianity, love. In the one, mysticism. And it's interesting, the Sufis approach Allah through mysticism called light mysticism, right? Light mysticism. Mm -hmm. And of course, the light of Allah is, um, you might know him as Muhammad. And then of course, for basic Muslims, you approach Allah through fear. Man's will is free will. And of course, the word deen in Islam is about imposing your will on another. If you read the definition of the word deen, I've covered this in other mm -hmm. shows. Deen is the imposition of your will, subjugation, and that is the concept of the one. You, yep. your, your will, they impose their will on you. And of course, both of these, predestination, both of these cover the character of Allah. Man's purpose is to know the Creator and to submit to the Creator and obey the Creator. In both cases, this meets the definition of Allah. And yeah, so understand the concept of Allah goes back to at least 200 years prior to Muhammad's birth. So again, another source where he took ideas and these ideas and just mashed them up. Basically, he took a bunch of stuff, dumped it in a bowl, mixed it up, pooped into the bowl, mashed it up again, and there you go, Islam. <clears throat> you yep. want to say uh, Well, Dra Dragon said something very, very profound here. She just said, in Islam, you're a slave of Allah. In Christianity, you become a child of God. Um, and I, I don't Good. think you could sum it up any better than that. Yeah. Yes, well said. Okay, let's continue. So... Let's look at Jeffrey. Now, this, of course, um, Islam Critique mentions Jeffrey on a regular basis in his talks. This is Jeffrey's book called Islam, Muhammad, and His Religion. And he says the old Arabian paganism was in the process of disintegration. Judaism and Christianity were widely represented in Arabia and to a lesser mm -hmm. extent Zoroastrianism and certain Gnostic sects. Right. So understand. So several preachers of monotheism had arisen and each had gained a following. But it was Muhammad who succeeded in syncretizing certain basic elements of Ju Judeo-Christian faith and practice with native Arabian beliefs. Yeah. Syncretizing is basically taking stuff and just smashing it together and there you go. You know? So so that's what Muhammad did. And so this is written about, this is this book dates to the 50s already. Mm -hmm. now, let's look at the Encyclopedia of Islam. They speak of the Gnosis, the Marifa, which he describes. So Dunun was the first to teach the true nature of Gnosis. Now, this is the first Islamic scholar to really talk about the, Gnosis, the Gnostics, the Gnosis. He describes this as knowledge of the attributes of the unity 
And I find this really interesting that it's the gnosis is the knowledge of the attributes of the unity. If Allah is indivisible, if Allah is one, how can it be a unity? Understand? And he speaks, and this yeah. belongs to the saints. When they say saints, they mean the Sufi saints. The highest in Islam, the highest spiritual level in Islam is to be a Sufi. They are the highest ones. And they contemplate the face of God within their heart. And God revealed himself to them in a way in which he is not revealed to others in the world. So the Sufis can see God in a way that no one else can. Right. AT? Right. Uh, well, I was I was reading something that Daniel wrote earlier, and he said Muslims say that Muhammad is the door to paradise, that every man must pass through um, for entry, and and, and I, I think that's pretty much correct, right? So in order for me to become a Muslim, Lloyd, what do I have? I have to say something specific, right? Um, yeah, you have to spin around three times, and you have <laughs> to um, stamp your left foot once, twice, and then uh -huh. you have to. Um, yeah, then you have to say the Shahada, which is not found in the Quran. Right. And and it, it, it pronounces that there's only one God, right? Which is fine. I think everybody agrees with that. Mm -hmm. But then how do I actually get to that God, right? It is through pronouncing Muhammad as his prophet. So in fact, um, I, I would I would agree with Daniel at that, at that point, right? So like you literally cannot enter paradise um, unless you pronounce that Muhammad is the prophet. In so fact, he according is according to the Islamic law, according to Sharia, and I probably show this later, Allah does not accept your submission. Allah does not accept your faith unless you accept Muhammad. Nor mm -hmm. is this in the Quran explicitly stated anyway. The 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 Shahada that Muslims follow is not in the Quran. Right. There's only right. a Shahada that speaks of Allah, right? Now, mm -hmm. the, the addition with Muhammad is an innovation, Bidda, that came much later, right? So, right, and I'm, I'm going off a of memory here, but I, as I recall, the Dome of the Rock only had the first part of the Shahada written on it. It didn't yes. add the Muhammad thing until later. Yes, correct. And notice also, they speak of here the Gnostics. So this is the Gnostics, Muslims, Gnostics. Right mm -hmm. now, notice so I'm going to lift over here. Now, what did the Gnostics do? The name Kashif in Islam, you'll hear Muslim names like Kashif in mysticism. What is mysticism? Well, go look it up. The occult, the act of lifting and tearing away the veil which comes between man and the extra phenomenal world. Understand? Mm -hmm. So, the act of lifting and tearing away the veil, these, these are mystical practices. And of course, if you start looking, you're going to find crazy mystical practices. Welcome to a new subscriber. Thank you for, for joining the channel. Right. Now, this book, um, I've got a link in my Dropbox. If you go to the Dropbox, you'll find this linked there. The Kashif al Mahjub, the oldest Persian treatise on Sufism. Read it. It is just about Gnosticism, Gnosticism, Gnosticism. Mm -hmm. On and on and on, nonstop. Now, let's continue. Let's look at similarities with Allah, part four. Right. The Demiurge. Now, the Demiurge is one of the eons created in the created. Oh, sorry, the Demiurge, which is one of the eons, created the physical world. Now, mm -hmm. eons with an E is about time, but the aeons with an A is, is a spirit being created by the monad. Now, the Demiurge is said to be a malevolent, evil, and false god. Very important, the false god. Mm -hmm. It is a heavenly being subordinate to the supreme being that is considered to be the controller of the evil, physical, material world, and it is antagonistic to all that is purely spiritual. It seeks to keep us locked in the material. So the Jesus of the physical realm, according to this idea, is evil according to this paradigm. Because Jesus would be of matter, and matter is evil. So you could not... Now, of course, this is probably a corruption of the idea that man could not enter into the Holy of Holies, which was sacrosanct, because God is pure. And man had to be completely purified. They had to go through a ritual. Mm -hmm to enter into the Holy of Holies. Uh, your thoughts yeah. on that, A.T.? Um, let's just keep going. I really don't have any thoughts to that. Okay. Now, let's have a look. Now, you can go to archive.org, right? We're going to look up Dean al -Battle. We need Tafsir Kurtavi Volume 1. I'm going to make a reference to this. I'm just going to move my camera again. There's a passage in the Tafsir Kurtavi. Do not mix up truth with falsehood and knowingly hide the truth. Do not mix up truth with falsehood. A thing is mixed up when it is mixed with something similar to it. Then it is not mm -hmm. clear. Qatada said that the meaning of the phrase is do not mix up Judaism and Christianity with Islam. It says that they are separate. The word used for falsehood 
is batal. So do not mix up Islam, truth, because Islam calls itself the Deen ul Haq, the religion of truth. Christianity and Judaism are the Deen al Batal. The Deen al Batal are the religions of falsehood, which means when something becomes unsound and worthless. So the official, formal, and I'll get more into that, orthodox position of Islam and Christianity is that it is unsound and worthless. It can also mean in vain, as in, and they go on to describe, your prayers fall as dust at your feet. The, the deity doesn't even hear you, doesn't know you exist. The false, al Batal is one of the names of Satan. So we are worshipping one of the religions of Satan. This mm -hmm. is the position of Islamic scholars on Christianity. Right. Okay, so now divine elements from the monad fall into the material realm and these are locked within us right and these little elements of the divine want to return to the spiritual realm now there's a lovely story there as well so the divine element returns to the spiritual realm when the gnosis or special secret knowledge of the divine is obtained salvation is of, is based on obtaining this secret knowledge mm -hmm. right so salvation is knowledge based but they don't ne don't necessarily mean just normal knowledge like one plus one is equal to two Right. <clears throat> this is special knowledge, deep knowledge, real deep understanding, a, a really involved understanding. Okay. But let's have a look at Islam since we're talking about knowledge. Let's look through the index of the Sharia, of the most popular Islamic law manual. Knowledge of the heart, community, communally obligatory knowledge, religious sciences. Going to get to that. This worldly knowledge, recommended knowledge, subjects that are not sacred knowledge, unlawful knowledge, offensive knowledge, permissible knowledge. Read to the Sharia. It's all coded. Knowledge, 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 everywhere. This mm -hmm. term of the Nasis is everywhere. And yeah. they speak of the superiority of sacred knowledge over devotions. Devotions are things like prayer, things that are pillars of your religion. So having sacred knowledge trumps everything. Now, while he says, say, are those who know, those who have knowledge, the ulama, ulama are what? The people of knowledge. And alim is someone of knowledge. What are the Taliban? Well, Taliban comes from, right? These are the students of knowledge. Taliban is a student, right? Mm -hmm. Student of knowledge. Are those who know and those who do not know equal? Quran 39.9. Well, no, because those who have special knowledge. Allah raises those of you who believe and those who have been given knowledge whole degrees. Quran 58.11. Mm. Whoever Allah wishes well, he gives knowledge, gnosis of the religion. The superiority of the learned Muslim over the devotee is as my superiority over the least of you. The scholars, the learned Muslim is the scholar, and this is Muhammad speaking. Understand? Mm. So the scholar is so far above the basic Muslim, the lay Muslim, as Muhammad is over the least of the basic Muslims. Super Tiki wow. says, what's your thought of Christians using Allah as God? I would not be happy with that. Um, Allah just means the God. It's Arabic for the God. It's a descriptor. It's not a name. Mm -hmm. So, right. look, it, 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 there is a commonality in, in Arabia, but I don't think, yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a different entity. It's, become, it's come to mean something completely different. Right. I, I think just for the, basic, for the basic word, the actual meaning of the word, Allah, like you said, it's just the God. Um, just like I could say Lloyd, and Lloyd, obviously, I'm, I'm talking about Lloyd here in front of me. But a lot of people, a lot of different people have the name Lloyd, and I'm not speaking to them. I'm speaking just to Lloyd. So the word Allah can be just very general. It could mean yeah. it could mean, you know, the the Muslim understanding of who God is. It could mean the Arabic Christian version and understanding what they mean. It could be the Jewish understanding of what it means. It could be just some other random religions um, understanding what it means. But at this point in time, Allah has such a strong connotation to being the Islamic God, right, which comes with the full description of, of who it is. It's just kind of very challenging to to say it. I wouldn't say it's a, a sin or anything like that. To use the word, I would just say it's it would probably just be confusing to people if they if they heard you say it. Yeah, uh, there's another question. So, by the way, you know, someone people are talking recently about Baal, you know, the God Baal, right? Mm -hmm. or Baal or whatever people want to call him. But you know that Baal, yep. Baal has a wife and Baal's wife's name is Baala. Mm -hmm. Did you guys know that? Baal has a wife <laughs> and her name is Baala. 
a lot. Very, very curious. A lot. You know. Anyway, yeah. moving on. Well, maybe that. Allah is the the son of Baal and Baala. I would I would say or the the. Well, he's he's not even a son, or he's like a transvestite or something, right? He doesn't yeah, have a. Knows. Okay, so someone <laughs> asks me, Lloyd, would it be good in conversation to build rapport? No, because then you are submitting to a different paradigm of God. Understand? God has a name. God identifies. Just so, by the way, just to be woke for a minute, mm -hmm. God identifies as male, and God, his pronoun is Yahweh, him, he. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, just so you know. So no, I do not agree with her. She God identifies very clearly as male, you know, pronouns yeah, I, him he, and he has a name, and he likes his name. Understand? So right. No. So what I would say to you, Daniel, I, I think it, it, it's a good question. What I would actually do before engaging in that conversation is just define terms. Say, you know, hey, Mr. Muslim, what or Miss Muslim, whatever. You probably can't talk to a female, so Mr. Muslim. What do you what do you define a law as, right? And have them give their description, their definitions, um, and then you say, well, look, this is what I define God as. You know, you say Trinity, Triune, came to Earth, has the ability to do all these things. So then, right from the get go, you can have two different understandings. So you be, you know what? We'll use the word Allah for the description of what you believe God to be in Islam, and I'll just use the word God or Yahweh or whatever, um, so that we don't have to keep mixing terms just so you keep them keep them both separated that's yeah. that's what i've done with muslims in the past um not that you have to do that but i i've just found it to be a lot easier to just define terms from the get-go yep now notice again from the sharia whoever travels a path seeking knowledge allah makes easy for him a path to paradise what kind of knowledge hmm, gnostic knowledge maybe angels lower their wings for the seeker of knowledge those in the heavens and the earth and the very fish in the water ask Allah to forgive the person endowed with sacred knowledge. Notice if you read the Gospel of Thomas, which has just coincidentally 114 sayings of the Gnostic mm. Jesus. Sheer coincidence. And one of them <laughs> says, one of them speaks of the fish in the water. But then, hey, just I have no idea. Muhammad didn't make up anything. He was never a plagiarist. Yep. The superiority of the learned Muslim over the devotee is like the superiority of the moon over all the stars. The learned are the heirs of the prophets. The prophets <laughs> have not bequeathed dinar, which is money, nor dirham, money, but have left sacred knowledge, and whoever takes it has an enormous share. Now we talk about knowledge. So this world and what is in it are accursed, except for the remembrance of Allah and someone with sacred knowledge or someone learning sacred knowledge. The world is evil. The world is accursed. David Rice mm -hmm. says, take beer. I know. I know. Take you know beer. <laughs> you know what's crazy? You go to the Middle East, and I've traveled all over the Middle East, and everywhere you go, they have fake bacon, making turkey bacon. <laughs> and you're like, if, if you guys want bacon, just, just eat it, please. You I don't mean, know what you're missing, guys. <laughs> And you're like, you know what? I take bacon. Look, as you guys know, bacon is a vaccine specially invented against Islam. <laughs> That's it, okay. It, yeah, that'll that'll. You know what? Honestly, I feel like all this polemics and, and apologetics that we do, it, it's not as powerful as the taste of bacon to get someone to turn away from Islam. Um, maybe that should be our new our new idea. Just you know, yeah, cook yeah. bacon. Offer them <laughs> bacon, people. You know, bring them uh -huh. to the. Okay, moving on. So this world and what is in it are accursed. Remember, the Gnostic idea is that the world of matter is evil. So the world is cursed except for sacred knowledge. Again, parallels mm -hmm. with Gnosticism, right? Now, Yahya ibn Abi Katir said, studying sacred knowledge is a prayer. Sacred knowledge, okay, having sacred knowledge. What sacred knowledge? This is a prayer. And of course, there is nothing that is superior to seeking sacred knowledge. Very interesting. This is again within the within the reliance of the traveler. Mm -hmm. Nawawi says there are similar statements from whole groups of early Muslims I've not mentioned that are like those I've quoted. The upshot of which is that they concur that devoting one's time to sacred knowledge is better than devoting it to voluntary fasting or prayer. Better than saying subhanallah, literally exalted is Allah above any limitation or any other devotions. Again, they're stating right. that the knowledge, the secret knowledge, the Nasis, is greater than the five pillars of Islam. 
Right. So this so this concept of grace and the 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 superiority of of God to to not only create the universe and and, and whatnot, but in in Christianity, God comes to us to be an example for us to pay for the sins that that we have committed so that through his love we are able to be saved. It's it's his power, by his power and his grace, we are able to enter into heaven. But in this concept here of of Gnosticism, and especially as it relates to Islam, God apparently is not strong enough and doesn't have enough love and doesn't have enough grace in order to do that. He places that full burden on top of mankind to somehow be able to to shuffle around in the dark and, and find this light and find this gnosis and knowledge so that then they can earn their own salvation through that sacred knowledge. Um, to me, that's a huge issue. Um, you know, it kind of goes along with with them being um, Unitarian. And so there's just a big theological issue that comes along with that. Yeah. Let's continue. So now let's look at this from the Sharia. Again, let's look at the Quranic evidence for following the scholars, right? Ask those who know if you know not. Usually this is translated as no. And again, this knowledge they speak of in the Quran is the gnosis. Ask those who know. That's why Muslims used to say, please, have you consulted a scholar? Okay, so I used to say to them, have, now I say to them, have you consulted a scholar? Because I have, because when they kept saying to me, please consult a scholar, I went and consulted the scholars. Ask those who recall, if you know not. By consensus of all scholars, this verse is an imperative for someone who does not know a ruling and sacred law or the evidence for it to follow someone who does. That's called taklid. Virtually all scholars of the fundamentals of Islamic law have made this verse their principal evidence that it is obligatory for the ordinary person to follow a scholar who is a mujtahid. So you are meant to follow a scholar because the scholars have knowledge. They are the people of knowledge. Let's continue. The ulama, the people of knowledge. So related words, alim, faqih, ulama. Ulama. The term denoting scholars of almost all disciplines, although more specifically scholars of the religious sciences. They are regarded as the guardians, the transmitters, and the interpreters of religious knowledge and mm. of Islamic doctrine and law, embracing those who fulfill religious functions in the community that require a certain level of expertise or knowledge in religious and judicial issues. The alim is often seen as a, opposed to the adib, he of profane knowledge right so versus profane knowledge right so understand now this is taken out of the encyclopedia of islam links in the description okay let me continue now the very first opening index of the reliance of the traveler says that chapter a is sacred knowledge and then why you have to follow the people of knowledge right then they talk about the knowledge of good and bad. Why? Because morality in Islam is based upon knowledge of the Sharia, not your feelings. It says you have to know, you have to ask the scholars and they will give you the knowledge. Don't forget the knowledge of the tree of good and evil. Mm -hmm. Okay. Allah is the name. Allah just means the God smiler. I mean, it's not an actual name. Yes, it's become his name, but Allah just means the God. It's a descriptor, right? Allah is the, is the term. That may be, but then we'll have to look at it. I mean, because if you look at some of Dan, I've looked at Dan Gibson's work, and I mean, he speaks of Bar Shaman, and that's that's he's got some very very compelling information there. Right, moving on though, science. Let's look at science. Ilm, alim, faqih, ulama. Now, within the Encyclopedia of Islam, religion in Islam is is the same as mysticism and mystics. Mystics, well, these guys do occult magic rituals, right? Jurist, faqih, okay, ulama, faqih. It denotes anyone possessing knowledge. So a faqi possesses knowledge. Fiqh of a thing, okay? Which is synonymous with alim and ulama. And again, ulama, remember, people of knowledge. Let's look at ulama, plural of alim, okay? Active participle of alima, to know. To know what? To have the knowledge, right? And however, the term refers more specifically to the scholars of the religious sciences. Now that's mm -hmm. interesting, religious sciences. Let's take a look. At this word sciences for a moment through the knowledge through the lens of the Bible so this is Gnosticism Jesus special knowledge now some Gnostics texts claim that Jesus taught that the world was a prison created by an evil God that would be in the first apocalypse of James mm -hmm. right? then 
the world is guarded by evil archons who require a secret password. Okay? Secret sure. knowledge. The password is password. <laughs> Now, Paul warns Timothy in 1 Timothy 6, verses 20 to 21. Paul warns Timothy about Gnosticism when he says, O Timothy, guard what is committed to your trust, avoiding the profane and the idle babblings and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge, the Gnosis, by professing, by professing it, some have strayed concerning the faith. So, mm -hmm. again, he's writing about the church, the early church, which has gone awry, right, gone astray, and they are professing secret knowledge, Gnosticism. And he's saying, right. no, this is false knowledge. Now let's have a look at other translations of 1 Timothy. Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science, falsely so-called false science, which some professing mm -hmm. have erred concerning the faith. Islam makes a huge deal of it. Sacred science, sacred science, religious science, science of Adit, science of this, science of that. When they speak of, and I will, we'll talk more, but it's constantly about science and the Bible <laughs> warns about Islamic science. AT? Um, can you go back like two slides for me? I was I was reading through it and um, it, it, it took me a minute to like fully grasp this one right here. Yeah. So the ulama, so you were saying that the scholars um, are, you said earlier that the scholars are as far above the, the normal people as Muhammad is above the least amount of people, right? So basically you're saying that the scholars are the highest echelon possible, the highest authorities when it comes to understanding and interpreting the religion of Islam. Is that Their correct? levels within the scholars, I will get to that. But yes, the okay. Sufis are higher than the normal Mujtahids because the Sufis so, have not only mastered the Sharia, they've also mastered the Hakika, the spiritual so, understanding of Islam. Gotcha. So the, the the lay Muslim, the um, you know the internet the jihadi Muslim that we interact with for the most part, when we show them you know perhaps embarrassing hadith or an embarrassing rulings um, from Sharia manuals and and what the ulama have stated, and they disagree with them, essentially they are kicked out of Islam. I mean, like how how can how can a normal person sit there and say that they they know more than the ulama when Muhammad himself said that uh, they're they're above yeah. basically even him. Look, unfortunately, the, remember, it's, it is obligatory. It is mandatory for Muslims to lie to you in circumvention of you. And they they just winning at all costs is really what they're about. It's got nothing to do with, with knowledge. You are wrong. Yeah. You are evil by default. But yes, it's stupid. I know. Let's move on. In fact, a general tendency was to be observed among practitioners of the religious sciences to consider a certain knowledge only that inherited from Muhammad, albeit with nuances conditioned by their theological orientation. So Muhammad, you see, brought special knowledge. Muhammad brought secret knowledge of the religious sciences. When, I, when Islam speaks of science, they don't mean the kind of science that we know, like, you know, like where semen is produced, you know, like real stuff and that the earth the sun doesn't rise out of a puddle well but, but spiritually but the spiritual gnosis of that is just real scientists don't understand well right dude Islam <laughs> just hurts my brain so <laughs> now let's look have a look let's have a look at this this is a reference again from the encyclopedia of islam now they speak here of for ibn Taymiyyah, blah 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 this the science par excellence okay the pinnacle of science is that which derives from the Prophet Muhammad. Now, I don't recall him winning a Nobel Prize myself, mm -hmm. but apparently he... He did win a Nobel Peace Prize? No, no, no. He he would win a Nobel Pedophilia Prize if they handed one of those out, oh, but, would. but apparently the greatest of science originates with Muhammad. All the rest is either useless or does not deserve to be called science. So apparently... <laughs> so, in other words, only Islam, the Islamic <laughs> sciences, the religious knowledge. Remember, the religious knowledge in Islam is a science. and uh, uh, Right? And the jurist, yeah, that, blah, blah, blah. Stepping into, the, stepping into the restroom with your left foot prevents the shaitan from in, in, <laughs> interfering with yes, your bowels. Yes, you have to say an incantation, exactly. And there are <laughs> numerous prophetic traditions, hadith, on the study of science, which concern only religious knowledge. Do you understand? Science in Islam is an understanding of secret science, esoteric, occult science. Mm -hmm. Now, yeah. let's continue. 
The ulama have long been seen as a very distinct group, a regulated and structured body expressing the popular voice constituting the solid framework of permanent government behind changing dynasties. You would mm. know them as the deep state. Right, yeah. Right? Now, let's have a look at this word ghaib. Now, this is, now we're talking about hidden knowledge and the Illuminati. Let's have a look. Ghaib, what is hidden? What is inaccessible to the senses and to reason? With rare exceptions, it stands for mystery. In mysticism, it means the reality of the world beyond reason, which gnosis experiences. Ghaiba, occultation, what is hidden. In mysticism, blah, 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 blah. Right? So Islam has a term for this, what is hidden, what the scholars know that you don't. Right? Let's continue. Well, now, you know what I was thinking, actually, really quick? Remember that movie Weird Science no. from, like, the 80s? They uh, there's like t two nerds uh, get together oh, and yes. uh, this actually reminds me a lot of Islam. They get together and they create like the 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 perfect uh, like robot type of woman. I, I feel like that weird science yeah. um, is a little bit what happens when you get to Jenna, right? Like you have your your yeah. seventy two um, perfectly created um, virgins, apparently perpetual virgins with see through skin, and you can see yeah. their bone marrow. Yeah, uh, well, which is I should mention that Smiler did say that. Allah, without a hyphen, means the name of God, which is apparently different to Allah, set as a different term, meaning the God. So, okay. so, yeah, I mean, he speaks Arabic, so he should know. So we can chat about that again. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, but thanks for that clarification. I appreciate that, uh, Smiler. So, okay, let me have a look here. So, no. Moving forward, this is from Al-Ghazali. Al-Ghazali is the number one scholar of Islam, above even the four Imams, right? Who founded the four schools of jurisprudence. And he's the number one scholar of Islam just below Muhammad. Okay, so he's the greatest scholar who ever lived besides Muhammad. This is in his book, the Ikhya al No, 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 it's not. It's in the Mishkat al-Anwar, the niche for lights. And this book makes many, oopsie, sorry, <coughs> makes many direct references to Gnosticism. But let's look at this little line that says here. Okay, so the concepts of Gnosticism of Amr, right, contains much that is obscure and too difficult for most minds. Okay, and Ghazali then says that the perfect Illuminati, and who's he referring to? Who are the perfect Illuminati in Islam? Well, that would be the Sufis. The perfect Illuminati perceived that Al Mutta, the obeyed one, is not more than the highest other than absolute deity and is related to him as the sun to essential light. So, you see, those who stopped short of complete illumination, right, those who didn't really understand the Gnosticism, who didn't become illuminated, right, those who were not mm -hmm. illuminated, right, they identified al mutta that's apparently Muhammad with Allah, right, blah, blah, but this is, this is weird nonsense, very hard to understand, but what he says here is that the Gnostics are the perfect Illuminati, right? And that Muhammad relates to Allah the way the sun relates to essential light. And we'll get into that. Hmm. So, yeah, the perfect Illuminati, according to Ghazali, are the Sufi. And remember, we just saw here that we just saw that the ulama are a permanent government behind changing dynasties. A secret government, a deep state that remains despite the changes of governments. Okay, I understand. So, and it goes on because the Sufis follow a form of mysticism called light mysticism, and that's where Muhammad becomes the light of the world. And we shall go on. Now, let's continue. So, in Islam, we're going to talk about someone asked me this earlier, you did. Islam, we're going to talk about the divisions and the levels of knowledge within Islam. Yep. So, Islam is divided into two. Islam has the Sharia, right? The Sharia and the Hakika. Sharia is obeying Allah. Hakika mm -hmm. is knowing Allah. Mm. Right? So these are two separate things. Now knowing Allah, the character, the nature, the essence of Allah, knowing the ultimate reality, communing with Allah. Communion is something for all Christians. You commune with God. You go to church, you take communion, you commune with God. Only the Sufi commune with God, no one else. Sufi are the highest levels of Islamic scholars. Let's continue and explain more of this. There are four levels within Islam. So now we have the two divisions. 
There are four levels in Islam. You have the Ibarah, the Ishara, the Lataif, and the Haqqaiq. Right? Now, welcome, Nicholas. Good to see you. Now, understand, let's look at the Ibarah. Let me just go back to the top here. The Ibarah, this is from the Encyclopedia of Islam, in mysticism, the literal language, which is, this is a typo, it's supposed to say suitable, not unsuitable, it's a typo, right? In mysticism, the literal language, which is suitable for exoteric topics, in contrast to the coded, secret, hidden, mystical language of Ishara. Exoteric means intended for or suitable for communication to the general public. The general mm. public is John Q. Muslim. Okay, John Q. Right. Idiot in the YouTube comments. He is at the Ibarra level of understanding, the literal okay. language, which is so he knows what he's been told, which is suitable for him as part of the general public. Yeah. Then you have a higher level of Muslim. Now, the next level is the Ishara, which means gesture, sign, indication. Okay, it acquired the technical meaning of allusion. Now, allusion is to refer to, to imply, implied or indirect, subtle, hidden references. It comes from the Latin adludere, to play with words. To play with words, to fool you, to play with words. In mysticism, ishara is the esoteric language of the inexpressible mystical experience, experiences beyond words, beyond rationality. It is a symbolic expression, a silent gesture, symbolism. Why do you think these occult groups always have symbols? Because you can't describe it in words. Mm. Latifa, single, right? Latifa, single, and plural, lataif. In mysticism, the subtle organ, a theory of levels developed from the time of Najm al-Din Kubra and the mystics of his school. What's interesting is that the this is from the index of the Encyclopedia of Islam, not the full encyclopedia. Okay, I just I wasn't going to go through like a whole long, but you can go to volume five three hundred B and volume twelve seven fifty three B, right? But it's interesting. It doesn't say anything here about the Latifa. It actually avoids it. So which is very interesting. They kind of even the Encyclopedia of Islam will just flat out lie to you sometimes. So let's look at the Hakika. Plural, haqqaiq, reality, essence, truth. In exegesis, the basic meaning of a word or an expression and is distinguished from blah, from metaphor. So it is reality. It is the real, the actual, the truth, the ground truth, the fundamental truth. In philosophy, the, okay, the ontological meaning is translated as nature or essential reality. The logical meaning is the truth, which is the exact conception of the thing established in the intelligence. So this is mean with the mind perfectly absolutely understand something mm -hmm. but this is a knowledge beyond the rational it's a knowledge beyond rational knowledge in mysticism it is the profound reality to which only experience of union communion with allah opens the way now the al hakika al muhammadiyya okay is the universal rational principle through which the divine knowledge is transmitted to all the prophets and the saints called the Ruh muhammad or the spirit of muhammad so understand according to islamic thought at the highest levels of its scholars the true understanding of the universe is through the fact of the Mohammedan reality. Muhammad understood reality in a profound way because Muhammad is the direct path to God. No one comes to the Father but through me, as Muhammad said. And, mm -hmm. he is the, and the spirit of Muhammad is what infuses the saints. The spirit of Muhammad, you may have heard of it. It's in the Bible, it's called the Holy Ghost. And Hakai right. is the term for secret philosophical doctrines and we need to dig a little more into this but any questions or comments at so far no dude this is a lot of information i'm probably going to have to uh re-watch a little bit at least this last part again this is really deep deep stuff but um somebody said basically so the hikaka the uh the Hakai. mysticism is the highest level of islam correct yeah so you've got your four remember you've got your ibara ishara right and the, the yasir qadis and shabi shabi sheikhs and all that they're right. on the Ishara level. And then the next level is the Sufis. The next two levels are yeah. for the Sufis. The saints of Islam are Sufis. They're all Sufis. So the next two levels of understanding, right? It's strictly, it's a pyramid and you get to the top. The a pyramid, by the way. And then you get to the yeah. top and you've got the Sufis and they have the secret understanding of the character of Allah, the nature of Allah. Let's have a so look at what does the word mysticism mean? It's the experience of mystical union or direct communion with ultimate reality as subjectively reported by mystics. The belief mm -hmm. that direct knowledge of God, a spiritual truth or ultimate reality can be attained through subjective experience. And also, mysticism also means vague speculation of belief with no basis. 
Hey, Tim. <laughs> I like that definition the best. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I gonna, how, how do you pronounce that last? Is it Hikaka? It's it is Kaka. It is total Kaka. <laughs> well, but you know what? It, it it's complete me Kaka, of, but it's oh. the Hakika. Do you remember when a Ace Ventura right in the second the second Pet Detective movie when he's all on top yep. of the mountain, meditating and stuff, and then he's like Shakaka. <laughs> So that's how I'm going to remember that from now on. That is the most mystical form of yeah. of Islam. So now let's look at a scholar called Kashairi. He was the one who developed this doctrine to its pinnacle, right? And he's, uh, just to remind you what esoteric means, designed for or understood by the specially initiated alone, right? Mm -hmm. Requiring or exhibiting knowledge that is restricted to a tiny group, limited to a small circle, all right? Kushairi wrote a very famous book, Lataif al-Isharat bi Tafsir al-Qur'an. It is the most famous work, okay, by Kushari, that is a complete commentary of the Qur'an, but it's a mystical commentary. Mm. So he determined that there were four levels of meaning in the Qur'an. First level is the Ibara, which is the meaning of the text meant for the mass of believers, Islam for the masses, for the plebs, the idiots. Uh, if, yep. you're gonna, if your guy is going to talk nonsense to me in the comments, he's talking about you, buddy, you. <laughs> how can i say that in a very brief sentence to any of the the muslim trolls i want to i want to be able to be like you are an ibarra and like how many of them do you think will have any idea what i just told them they won't they have no clue they have no idea and built for speed says hey kaka yeah that one's exactly it's total kaka second the ishara only available to the spiritual elite Okay, only available to the spiritual elite. Who are the spiritual mm -hmm. elite? Well, those are the mujtahids, the scholars above them, right? And line yeah. beyond the obvious verbal meaning. So this is the lines between the lines, the words between the lines. What's between the lines? So That's the second level. Yeah. Are those are, are those like your imams and stuff? That would or be yeah, your your mujtahids, your sheikhs, your imams, your jurists, you know. But these are the okay. people of the Sharia. Smiler, that was thanks. Um, when we have a chance, I'll catch up with you on the um, Discord because I'm on Adam Seeker's Discord. Um, so yeah, I'll, um, if you guys want to find me, Adam Seeker's Discord is the place to go. Anyway, so the Ishara is only available to the spiritual elite. Now the fourth level, that's the third level. Sorry, the Lataif refers to subtleties in the text that were meant particularly for the Sufi saints, for those of great mystical and spiritual understanding. And mm. finally, of the Hakaik, which he said was only comprehensible to the prophets. Okay, now these are your top scholars, and these are the secrets yeah. that they are chasing. Right now, this text placed him among the elite of the Sufi mystics, and it's widely used as a standard. This is the standard of Sufi thought. Now, let's go yeah. back. Ibara, remember, literal language, Ishara, mm -hmm. gesture, okay, symbolic expression, esoteric language, and of course, mm -hmm. Latifa, mystic, right, and Akika the ultimate essence of reality right now we're going to about to end off guys we've i've gone on for a little while we're going to end off soon a basic view of islam and christ they said in boast we killed christ jesus the son of mary the messenger of allah but they killed him not nor crucified him but so it is made to appear remember i said docetism from docaine to seem it was made to appear but it seemed mm -hmm. to them but the, another was made to resemble him in other translations another was made to resemble him and those who differ therein are full of doubts with no knowledge but only conjecture mm. to follow for the surety they killed him not. Quran 4, 157, 158. Now this brings right. us briefly to Manichaeism, a dualistic Gnostic religious movement founded in Persia in the third century by Mani. And this thing is crazy. Read up on Manich. Oh, it's nuts. Who was known yeah, as the apostle yeah. of light, the supreme mm -hmm. illuminator. Now, in this book, uh, let me just get the reference so that in case someone asks, this book is Heterodoxies of the Shiites according to Ibn Hazm. Okay, it's available mm -hmm. on archive.org, heterodoxies of the Shiites, according to Ibn Hazm, right? And this is the influence of Docetism on Islam. It seems highly probable that this doctrine, Docetism, came to the Muslims through the medium of Manichaeism, right? Which adopted this belief and gave it a definite shape. The Jesus of the Manichaeans had no objective reality as a man. His human appearance at birth and baptism were mere apparitions, and so were his sufferings. It was not he who was really crucified, but an emissary of the devil who tried to frustrate the instructive activity of Jesus, and who, as a punishment for his wickedness, was fastened to the cross by Jesus himself. That is from Kessler. Now, this book dates to, I don't know, probably the late 1800s, early 1900s. But, yes, so 
now you understand so this is another gnostic influence now let's go to p7523 in the islamic sacred law say O oh, people of the book do not be excessive in your religion mm -hmm. according to the exegetes this is and this is from tafsir Qutbi, this refers to the extremism of the jews concerning jesus in accusing mary of fornication and the extremism yeah. of the christians in considering jesus a god for both mm -hmm. excessiveness and remissness are evil and both are kufr unbelief right and it's amazing how they misrepresent what christians actually believe even in that statement right so the christians for considering him a god right yeah. trinitarian christians don't consider jesus to yeah. be a god, god. We're, we're trinitarians he so it's, it's interesting how they misrepresent and they still do even when i explain to people what a trinit like what trinitarian is i can give them you know um the 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 dogma on the statement they still are like but that's three gods i'm like oh uh, you know where do you right. go i don't even know so let's continue i'm going to try and finish in the next 10 minutes guys so notice here they speak of i am the truth so they speak of the christians the mistake of the christians who saw this that he is the truth in the person of jesus and they said that he was the divinity so the mistake of the christians now this is from the reliance of the traveler mm. right so we made a mistake in seeing jesus as the truth because muhammad's the truth and we said that he was the divinity because muhammad's the divinity let's continue now this is the formal within sunni islam this is the formal orthodox sunni islamic position on isa okay isa being technically being jesus but Isa mm -hmm. ibn Maryam, the prophet and messenger of Allah, to Bani Israel, to Israel, who denied him and plotted against him. He was known as the word of God because Allah created him without a father by the near word Bi, Kun, whereupon his mother, Maryam, conceived him. Among the many prophetic miracles given to him by Allah was he raised the dead. I'm just going to move my mouse here. He raised the dead, made the blind see, he healed lepers, and he molded a bird from clay and breathed into it, and it became a living bird, which, as anyone knows, is not from the Bible. It is a direct reference to the infancy gospel of Thomas, a mythical tale that has no biblical support. It is merely Correct. a myth, a folk legend, a tale, a story told to kids. Yep. Okay. Now, let me just go back a second. Okay. Now, right he so notice it is related that when the sacred law was summarized before him by a lawyer in the words by a lawyer now why by a lawyer think about it because the lower levels of islam the sharia those scholars those first two levels those are lawyers they're not priests they're lawyers the upper levels are mystics right so mm -hmm. it is that you love the lord your god with your whole heart whole soul whole strength and whole mind and that you love your neighbor as yourself isa confirmed him in this when bunny israel wanted to kill him Allah saved him, as described in the words of the Holy Quran. They did not slay him or crucify him, but it was made to seem to them. Docetism, to seem. Quran yep. 4, 157. When Yahuda, chief of the Jews, met with a band of his people to kill Isa, Allah sent Gabriel to Isa to lead him to a covered alleyway that had a skylight through which he was taken up to the sky. Yahuda, in pursuit, ordered one of his companions to follow Jesus into the passageway and then murder him. Allah cast the face of Jesus upon the man as he entered. And when he came out again after a fruitless search, the Jews attacked and killed this man, thinking him to be Isa, and then they hung him on a cross. This is the official doctrinal position of Sunni Islam. On so they killed him first, and then they hung him on the cross after he was dead? Is that what I just said? Yes. But of course, if you can read <laughs> Ibn Kathir, then they speak of a companion, the youngest companion of Jesus, Yep. said hey hey times. pick me pick me pick me pick me and then jesus yeah. said okay buddy you're gonna kill yourself off you go buddy and then they stick sick and then in other stories it's it's um it's um uh, so when they say that we are in doubt about it what they really mean is they themselves are in doubt about it right yeah so debit says where's this where are the witnesses dude there are no witnesses just it, it's 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 the witness enough. first of all dude don't even ask questions the witness is the almighty and all seeing allah okay the best of deceivers yeah. this so is you nonsense. have to trust I mean, but understand if you read ibn kathir then it's the youngest companion said hey pick me and jesus said okay buddy off you go and this guy insisted and then they picked him and they put his face on him and then they killed him <laughs> and then of course uh who, and then you have judas and in other versions it's judas who was punished uh -huh. i mean understand yep. they can't make up their own minds i mean it's just a mess or is this simon simon of serene too you know so they they literally don't know i just find it so ironic the projection 
Christians don't know. They're in doubt about it. No, we're not. I don't rec- I don't recall any Christians being in doubt about the death and resurrection of yeah. Christ. I don't even recall any modern historians or scholars or textual Correct. critics being in doubt about his crucifixion. Yeah. Veronica says, among all the unsuccessful heresies, Islam was the only one with a political goal and an army. And she's right. Yes. Yeah. Now, some claim it's Judas, but already hanged himself before the... Yeah, Judas hanged himself before the crucifixion. Thank you for pointing that out, Michiel. Maybe we just need to... You know, guys, you know what we're doing wrong. We just haven't taken the time to logically, factually explain to Muslims, oh, by the way, you've made a mistake with that. Here's the facts. Just give them the facts, and they will simply just understand and the problem is solved. That's all you need to do. Yeah, that's it. That's just, all you have to do. Just you give can them the facts, guys. To... I don't know why that's never been tried. You can appeal to, to secular historians, Jewish historians, contemporary historians of Jesus' time. You can you can do the Bible, you know, whatever. They'll they'll just go, oh, you know what? That's a lot of evidence. I will change my position. Everybody, That's you know, yeah. everyone does it. The moment you give them the facts, everyone changes their mind. It's the rational, logical thing. We all do that, right? Mm-hmm. Moving on. So now I want to talk about the Nuri Muhammadi, the light of Muhammad. This is found most exclusively in the biographies of Muhammad, the Sira, effectively the Gospels of Muhammad. So guys, last couple of slides, I'm going to end off soon. Eva, Muslims don't listen no matter what you give to them. Of course not. I was, I was being sarcastic. <laughs> yes. Muslims love the Gospel of Thomas and Barnabas more than the canonized ones. Don't ask me why. Yes, exactly. So guys, to end off, to begin ending off. <laughs> Now, the prophet was born on Monday, the 12th of blah, blah, in the year of the elephant. It was the most auspicious day in the history of mankind. But according to other scholars, he was born on the 9th. And according to other scholars, on different, they, they, can't even, they don't even know what day he was born. <laughs> the most auspicious day in the history of mankind. Yeah. Okay. And I mean, they'll, they'll say here, the, you know, whatever. They can't make up the day he was born. So now, let's have a look. Ibn Kathir, volume 1, page 210. Okay. They speak of... Ibn Farouk bore witness that only three persons in the entire history of Arabia had been called by the name Muhammad during the pre-Islamic mm. period. So Muhammad was mm. only the fourth person in all of history to be called Muhammad. Their Say not three. Heard... Yeah, so they had been given this name since their parents had heard from the Jews and the Christians that a new prophet was to be born in the near future and that his name would be Muhammad. The Jews and the Christians were telling the Arabians that a prophet by the name of Muhammad was going to be born. Where's, where's, is there any record of that, Lloyd? Like no, literally of course anywhere? Not. They, they literally sucked that out of... A Christian monk by the name of Bahira lived in the city. And he said, this is the chief. When he saw Muhammad, he said, this is the chief of the world and the messenger of God. God has sent him as a mercy for all mankind. Why do you say <laughs> this? And Bahira explained, when he came this side of the pass, the stones and the trees bowed in prostration. <laughs> <laughs> and they do not prostrate for anyone other than a prophet. I recognize him from the seal of prophethood, which lies like an apple on the soft bone below his shoulders. It is mentioned in our scriptures. It Seriously, is... we don't even have to write jokes. We can just read this. <laughs> I know. This is, this is what they teach. This is what they teach in the mosques. This is what they teach in the madrasas. Understand. Moving on. Let's look at this from the Milal Wanihal. Okay. Long before the creation of the world, Allah took a ray of light from the splendor of Allah's own glory and united it to the body of Muhammad, mm. called the Nuri Muhammadi, saying, Thou art the elect Muhammad, the chosen. I will make the members of thy family the guides to salvation. Muhammad mm. said, The first thing which God created was my light and my spirit. In due time, the world was created, but not until the birth of Muhammad did this ray of glory appear in the world. <laughs> It is well known to all Muslims as the Nur i Muhammadi, the light of Muhammad. This Nur, blah, 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 blah. How many children did Muhammad have that lived past, uh, you know, three years old? Because like, uh, it said like, that, that the, the light is going to go through his family. I just don't recall any of his family members yeah. actually living. So these, the Anabaptists, yes, they worship Muhammad. Dude, I, I need to go into that in a different show, but I can, I can tell you for sure. So Muhammad, the Muhammad of pre-existence <laughs> was created of divine light. When he had stood on as a column of light before God for a million years in adoration, mm. God created Adam from the light of Muhammad. Now you know, Adam was made oh. out of Muhammad. Or according oh. to another passage, he created Adam from the clay of divine might. Divine might from the light of Muhammad. Mm. Muhammad is, is the light. Brown cow. The divine might of Allah. Let's continue. 
right? Not only Adam, <coughs> let me just move the mouse, not only Adam is formed, the, ca <laughs> the camera, not only Adam is formed from Muhammad's light, but the whole universe participates in this emanation of light, like the monad emanates things. Interesting, Allah mm. also emanates things, the light of the prophets. So in other words, the, the glory, the, the spirit of the prophets, the message of the prophets is from Muhammad's light. And the light of the heavenly kingdom is from Muhammad's light. And the light of this world and the light of the world to come is from Muhammad's light. What Let's is this up. from? What, what, uh, what book is this from? It's, it's basically called S that I made up about Muhammad from an admiring <laughs> Muslim. Did it's the mystical vision of existence in classical Islam, and, okay, um, and also from S. W. Kula, Muhammad and Muhammadanism, from the chapter Muhammad, a parody of Christ. Right, I was going to say because they were absolutely parodying Christ, right? Yes, so when you and read there's the, a third uh, book John 1, 1, called I'm "When the well, Moon is Split." Certain. There's a third book yeah. called "When the Moon Split." Uh, guys, I'll make the links available. It should all be in the. It should all of these should be linked in the description, and you can download all the stuff and read it and laugh and cry to your heart's content. So understand, Muhammad is the light of the world. He's the light of heaven. He's the light of the universe. Muhammad is a deity. Okay, emanation, emanation, and everything is made from the light of Muhammad. Okay, God created. Let's have a look at this one in the Kintabi Ahwal Al Kiamat. Read the following. It is recorded by tradition that God first created a tree with 4,000 branches, the tree of life, and called it the tree of life. Then he created the light of Muhammad in a mm. veil of white pearl of the shape of a peacock and placed it upon that tree <laughs> where, where, where Muhammad's light praised God for 70,000 years. <laughs> Let's continue. In the shape of a peacock. Yeah, you can't then, make this stuff then up. God created the Kaaba and then he created the temple of Jerusalem. And he created all the houses of worship in the world. And then from the perspiration, okay, from the perspiration of Muhammad's eyebrows, right? From the perspiration of this figure of Muhammad, he created mm. the people of believing men and women, the Muslims of both oh. sexes. And of the perspiration of Muhammad's ears, he created the spirits of the Jews and the Christians, the Magi and what is like them. And of the perspiration of its legs, he created the earth from the west to the east and what is in it. And after mm. this, when the light of Muhammad had praised God for 70,000 years, God created the light of the prophets out of the light of Muhammad. So David, Moses, Solomon, all of them were created from the light of Muhammad. Okay, And they all looked upon that light and created their spirits. And they said, there is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is the apostle of Allah. Then God created a lamp, and the figure of Muhammad was placed on that lamp, just as he afterwards was in this world. And then the spirits of all mankind, the unborn spirits of all mankind, went around the light of Muhammad, praising and worshipping Muhammad for a hundred thousand years. Hey, wait, the wait, wait, wait. So, um, you know... Like Charlie Hebdo drew pictures of of Muhammad and like twelve people were shot and killed and somebody showed the picture in France and their their head got chopped off, um for for just drawing the image of Muhammad. So should we chop off Allah's head for creating a lamp um that had I'll hold him uh, down, buddy. I'll hold him down. Of Muhammad on it? I don't know how that works. So yes, I'll hold him down for you. So then, okay. this, yes, worshiping Muhammad and um, Veronica says I think these scholars are on drugs, no doubt. So then God commanded the spirits of all mankind, the spirits of heaven, to look upon the form of Muhammad, okay? And they all obeyed, except for a couple of guys, I'll tell you soon. And those who saw his head became a caliph and a sultan amongst men. Those who saw Muhammad's forehead became a just commander. Who saw his eyes became one who knows the word of God by heart. And then, of course, it's you idiots, in the, you idiots, that's you, Jews and Christians, you bad people. Because those who looked away and saw nothing became Jews and Christians. <laughs> even though all the prophetic lines come through that whatever it's fine <laughs> so, so the nemesis of infidel says this is a knowledge on a deeper level these sessions leave me speechless thank you for your time and your work there's for you're welcome thank you guys um this takes me hours of reading and research i would i do appreciate um if you support the channel really it mm -hmm. makes a difference in my life honestly absolutely um guys so yeah if you do want to contribute i i am always very grateful it really really helps this is not exactly five minutes of work believe me this is days of my life that goes into this okay so moving on 
So because you became a Druid Christian because you saw nothing, you looked away when Muhammad was standing as a pillar, pillar of light in paradise. So Muhammad, now when Muhammad was born, I was Amina's midwife. And in the night when the labor pain seized them, Muhammad Mustafa fell into my hands at his birth. A voice reached my ears from the unseen world mm. saying, The Lord show mercy unto thee. The face of the earth became so illuminated, filled with light, that I could see some of the palaces of Damascus by that light. Just so by the way, uh -huh. Damascus is 1,300 kilometers from Once America. again, proving that Muslims believe in a flat earth because the curvature of the earth would make that impossible to see, even if you could see that far and even if there was light, but yeah. whatever, continue. Yep, let's continue. Yes, yeah, so guys, I want to finish this up. Uh, it's going longer than I anticipated, but I, I'll, I'll just finish this. The learned doctors of religion differ as to which thing was the first created, okay? But, of course, others say that the light of Muhammad's prophetship was the first thing created by Allah. Moving on, when the light was created, Allah first created the light of Muhammad. Allah created first of all the light of Muhammad. And you are my chosen one, Muhammad. You are the trustee of my light and guidance. Muhammad, it is because of you, God says to Muhammad, that I am going to create the earth and the skies. Because of you, Muhammad, I will make the earth and the skies. I will lay down reward and punishment and bring into being the garden of paradise and the fires of hell for you, Mo. You my boy. <laughs> okay and then there's the covenant which is taken from all the souls which combine the belief in one god with acceptance so all the angels and all the souls of the world a covenant an agreement was made with all the souls which combined belief in the one god with acceptance of muhammad's prophethood so before you were born you believed in muhammad and then you were corrupted here on earth so this is why ibn abbas says i was a prophet when adam was between souls so muhammad is a prophet before even adam was born and muhammad's light adorns the throne the arsh the ass of Allah. Sorry, how do you say that? Is that ass? Muhammad's <laughs> light adorns the ass of Allah. I'll continue. Muhammad's mother said, When Muhammad was born, a light issued out of my vagina that lit the palaces of Syria 1,300 kilometers away. It was controversially reported that significant signs accompanied his birth. Fourteen galleries of Caesar's palace cracked and rolled down. The Magian's sacred fire died down. And churches on Lake Sawa right sank down and collapsed someone sent me a skype message i think let me check in case it's someone saying lord you're talking too much stop please stop no it's me because i want you to end the video with this <clears throat> okay fine and then <laughs> so guys i just wanted you to understand that muhammad is the light of allah muhammad is the light of the world muhammad is the counterfeit jesus mm. muhammad is a deity in islam this is what they say people worshiped muhammad Understand? right it's the ass of allah i agree with you i certainly agree the ass of allah right now jesus says in the bible i send you as lambs among liars okay let's see what islam explains about us let's talk a little bit more and this is the final slide with the last few things the discussion with the jews and the christians concerning their religions and the exposition of their faults and their shortcomings. The Medinan verses sought to invite the Christians and Jews to Islam primarily by exposing the corruption in their books and beliefs, by explaining the true teaching of Moses and Jesus. They can't show us the actual true teaching, right? They can't show us the actual books, right? They don't have them, not, but your books wrong. Not even a fragment. Yep. And the, the Medinan verses discuss in detail the history of the children of Israel and how Allah dealt with their faithlessness and treachery. The purpose of the stories. One of the primary purposes of these stories is to guide the remnants of the previous nations to the truth. The Christians, for example, are told that Isa preached pure monotheism and Jews are told to reflect blah blah blah. No other religion even comes close to this concept of Islamic monotheism. Jews and Christians, even Hindus, claim to be monotheistic, but the trinity of the Christians and the paganism and idolatry of the Hindus make it obvious that such a claim is false. The Jews are perhaps closer than many other religions to monotheism, attribute to their god forgetfulness, weariness and ignorance amongst other things and do not the jews do not have a firm set of spiritual beliefs okay buddy now not the path of those on whom you are angry nor those who are astray quran 1 7 that's the fatiha the prophet clearly muhammad explained that this refers to the jews and the christians he's angry with the christians no he's angry with the jews and the christians are astray so let me just move this up again the integrity of the prophets <clears throat> is denied by the Christians and the Jews who ascribe amongst other crimes the crime of murder, incest and drunkenness to the prophets of Allah, allegations which Islam vehemently denies. That's why Muhammad is perfect. 
don't forget it's a death penalty to claim that Islam and Muhammad are less than perfect right, right. this is what they're teaching let's continue Abdullah ibn Amr found two loads of books of the Christians and Jews these books form the basis of many of his Israeli narrations basically hadith taken out of the Jewish texts right None mm -hmm. of the companions use these narrations as sources of knowledge because the Quran is explicit that the Jews and the Christians tampered with their respective scriptures. They changed the divine revelation. Therefore, it is impossible to be sure which facts they added and which are still intact. Now, let's have a quick look. I'm just going to run through this. You're going to make up your own mind. The, the prayer of, this is from Ibn Qayyim again, back to that guy. The prayer of the Nazarenes, the Christians, ridicules God. Okay, so our prayers ridicule God. The Christians chose a way of prayer during which the most devoted among them would consider it no great matter if he happens to pass urine dripping on his thighs and legs. Then he would take the direction of the east, make the sign of the cross over his face, and worship the crucified deity, starting his prayer by saying blah blah blah. Then he would open a conversation with whomever happens to be sitting beside him in church, and most probably the chat would be about some mundane matters like the price of wine or pork, who won in gambling, what dish he prepared at home, and the like. And then... He would even interrupt his prayer to talk about similar things and then urinate in his seat if he can. <laughs> Compare this to the prayer of the Muslims. AT. Well, I mean, speaking of urine, I thought that somebody drank one of Muhammad's urine thing and then he promised him that he would never have a stomach ache again. Um, Muhammad as I recall, pure, there's forget. a couple of Bukhari hadith that talk about dogs urinating on the Kaaba. Um, and the only thing Muhammad did was just, you know, go over there with a pail of water and just dump yeah. it on there. So guys, final slide. I'm done. Finally done talking. Good grief has gone longer than I wanted. But it's been interesting though, dude. So I, it doesn't feel like it's been that long. So the finality of the prophet's message. This is from section W 4.0 in the Reliance of the Traveler. This is the final statement on the Islamic belief in terms of Christianity, right? The finality of the prophet's message. This section has been translated to clarify confusions among Muslims as to Islam's place among world religions. Previous religions were valid in their own eras as attested to by the Quran, but were abrogated by the universal message of Islam as is equally attested by verses of the Quran. Mm. Right? Yeah. So we have a problem with English speaking Muslims who are occasionally exposed to erroneous theories advanced by some teachers and Quran translators who affirm these religions validity, but they deny or do not mention they have been abrogated or that it is unbelief it is kufr to hold that the remnant cults now bearing the names of formerly valid religions such as christianity or judaism are acceptable to allah after he sent muhammad this is a matter over which there is no disagreement among islamic scholars scholarly quranic exegesis so in other words if the english-speaking muslim asks at times what and if the English-speaking Muslim at times discuss it as if there was some question about it, the only reason can be that no one has yet offered them a translation of a scholarly Quranic exegesis, a tafsir, to explain the accord between the Quranic verses and their agreement with the Sunnah. Mm. Islam is the final religion that Allah will never lessen or, ar or abrogate. So Christianity and Judaism are abrogated, they've been replaced, and we are remnant cults that refuse to worship behind Muhammad. Because as you know, when Jesus comes back, Jesus will worship behind Muhammad. And so Islam is very militant Gnosticism. Done. I'm done. I'll leave it <laughs> to you, A.T. Well, talking about abrogation, um, you know, there was the, the verses of stoning and of breastfeeding a, a, a grown man, right? Like five times or ten times or whatever. Um, somebody's saying abrogated. So I always say a bro goat ate it, you know, so because because it got eaten by a goat. That was part of yeah. that was I've I've heard some people say that Allah sent the goat or the tame sheep to come in and abrogate those particular things. So, yeah. So, guys, that's it. It took an hour and 55 minutes. Good grief. Uh, hey, had no technical errors today, though. I don't think we did, man. And it was honestly, it was it was super enlightening for me and super, super interesting. Um, yeah he's muhammad is a peacock dude you gotta let him fly that's all i'm gonna say yeah yeah i wish the arabs had more goats at the time they could have eaten more <laughs> of the quran <laughs> well they didn't have to because uh uthman came along and burned burned all of them anyway so that was enough yeah so guys yeah so that's it guys um so i hope you understand the connections now 
how Islam took so many ideas and it explicitly. I mean, this is there are many many of these of these um, Sharia manuals that explicitly discuss Gnosticism and Christians. I mean, sorry, Muslims are Gnostics and yep. Gnosticism is a critical part of Islam. So yeah, Islam is the antithesis of critical thinking. So, uh, AT, any final words? Um, no, man. I just, uh, Lloyd, thanks for thanks for putting this on, brother. Uh, I, I appreciate your time. I'm gonna. You don't know I'm gonna do this, but I'm gonna give you a shameless plug. As I was thinking about it, um, you have a Patreon, correct? No, I do not. You don't have a Patreon? Well, how do we pay you, dude? Uh, guys, at the bottom here, um, I'm just gonna. Sorry, let me just go back to the main screen. I've got a couple of pay links here on the bottom, guys, and the links are in my in the description box. So yeah, I do appreciate the support, guys. It really yeah. does go a long way. And, and honestly, guys, what I what what I would suggest is just you know even if all of his followers donate even a dollar a month, um, you know not that we're looking for handouts or anything specific like that, but you know to be quite frank with you, uh, Lloyd has this passion and he will do this for free just because he feels the calling from God to to do this and to expose the lies and and falsehoods of Islam. Um, but it's time that he's taking away to to give to us. Um, to give to you know the church, the body of Christ, and to really honestly just make the world a, a better place by doing this. Um, it's time that he sacrifices away from his family. It's time that he might be sacrificing yeah, doing actual work where he would be earning more money from it. Um, so if, if you can, if you can spare you know this, that, and the other, go ahead um, and, and follow whatever link Lloyd tells you to do. Um, you guys have noticed this in the chat. He is giving us a lot of great information and um just to just to show our thanks and appreciation for him i think um not not to make you blush buddy but i i, I think we should um be able to donate a little bit of our money if if we have enough um and i think that would be helpful for everybody uh yeah so there was a question from daniel ritter um check my previous stream with at last sunday mm -hmm. or last thursday we spoke we did a show on palestine the yeah Palestinian occupation of Israel that's going to answer a lot of questions and bring up a lot of information you probably had no idea about. Yeah. Um, but briefly <clears throat> speaking, any lands that Islam conquers is called is waqf. It's an endowment given to them by Allah to look after. If they lose it, they must get it back. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so guys, yeah, that's um, so. Check the previous show. I, I speak about the um, the Palestinian issue. I provide things. I mean, the Palestinians were Nazis, quite bluntly, and in fact, they were also just KGB. So uh, look through all of that, and yeah, built to speed. Thank you for your efforts in educating. So yes, guys, um, yeah, make this knowledge public. Please spread it around, share it with people. Um, everything that I've shown, all my sources are always available. My databases are available, and um, yeah, as you know, um, yeah, Muhammad is Baphomet. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Say. All right, buddy. Well, thanks for having me, everybody. I uh, hope you have a fantastic day. God bless you. For those of us in America, happy Memorial Day tomorrow. Um, yeah. And have a good one. Thank you, guys. Have a wonderful weekend. And uh, I may be away next week, some, next Sunday, so I may or may not be able to stream. But uh, I'll let you guys know. Anyway, guys, take care. Go well. Thank you, AT, as well. Always for your support and for being here with me to do these shows. Much appreciated. Thank you, guys. Take care. And please subscribe to AT, right? Really, he's linked in the description. All right. Thanks, guys. Take care. Bye.